We encourage you to open to Joshua 24. We're going to read verse 15. If you don't, it's going to be up on the uh, screen, and so we can still read it together. Please stand to honor the reading of God's Word. Verse 15. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today, this day, whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, shout, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Say that. We will serve the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. God, we ask that you would do something supernatural for those who are listening in this building and listening by video and even the one teaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at the life of Joshua, and Joshua has been teaching us some things as we wrestle with the question of what does it mean for me to make my mark in the world? And the first thing as we look at the life of Joshua, he's giving a speech right in this passage that we have just read. It is his last speech. It's just a little bit before he dies. He knows he's going to die after this. And so from the vantage point of this passage, the first thing that really comes to mind is a couple of set of questions that we all should wrestle with. Who will remember us when we're gone? Will it be our colleagues? Will it be the industry in which we've worked so hard in, whether it's high tech or sports or politics or education? Who will remember you when you're gone? Will it be your family and your close friends? And when they remember you, what will they remember about you? Now, if it's your family, I'm not talking about what they will say about you at your funeral or memorial. Because we have a tendency to say great things about folk who weren't all that great at funerals and memorials. I'm talking about what will they say about you when they're sitting around the kitchen table among dirty dishes. That's where the true stories come for. And if Joshua was here, he would say, and above all, will God remember you, the eternal God? And if the eternal God remembers you, what will he remember about you? And Joshua would say that there's a couple of things that have come to mind. One is, as we've learned the last couple of weeks, is that when it comes to making our mark, it's good to know that God has marked each of our lives. He's called each of us to be a part of his larger story. We're reminded in Joshua uh, 24, 29, that when he dies, here's how God remembers him. The son of none, servant of the Lord. And so Joshua would say, you want to be remembered by God. And so here he is in this, in this final speech. And the basic point that he's making to the nation of Israel is this. When I pass off the scene, I want you to continue to make sure that God is the cornerstone of your identity. I want, I want God to continue to be a big deal. Everybody say big deal. Big deal. A big deal in the totality of who you are. I want you to understand your existence based upon this fact. That you were born to be a part of God's story. Then he does something that's pretty remarkable. He says, but, everybody shout but. Is at this point, he's no longer speaking as the commander in chief of the army of Israel. He's no longer talking as the chief executive officer of the nation of Israel. He, he, he's not focused on his public ministry anymore. At this point, Joshua is kind of teaching us the distinction between things that matter and things that matter most. And for Joshua, what matters most is wrapped up in what he's about to say. And he says this, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Here's, what he, here's the insight that springs forth out of that. What Joshua is saying is that not only does God have a mark on my life, as for me, I want to end up being known as a servant of God. But God has a mark 
on my children's life. And so as, jo as I'm standing at the end of my life, Joshua would say, I'm racing ahead and I'm thinking about what I want God to remember at the end of my children's earthly life. And what I want God to remember at the end of my children's earthly life is that they too use their gifts and their talents and all that made them who they are to serve his larger story. John's just saying, I want God to say about my children, he or she is a servant of God. Do you want God to say that about your children? And so at this point, Joshua is saying, you know what? The most important thing is my ability to pass my faith to the next generation. It's at this point, Joshua is speaking as a parent. As a matter of fact, as an adult, uh, as a parent of adult children by this stage in his life. And some of you may say, well, I've kind of missed the opportunity to make my mark as a Christian on my kids' life because when they were kids, I was out there really, really bad. Now I know Jesus, but you know, they don't want to have anything to do with the church and I don't think I can do anything about that. Oh, no, yes, you can. You can go to those kids and have an adult conversation and say, listen, let me assume responsibility for all of the craziness and the madness that I brought into your life. Uh, and, and since then, uh, I've turned my life over to the Lord and I hope that that somehow uh, I can be a redeeming purpose in your life. Just own it and claim it. And then give them a chance to watch and see how God is changing your life. There's still more for you to do. Uh, Joshua is speaking as a grandparent. If there are any grandparents here, Joshua would say, look, the most important thing that you really, really want for your kids and your grandkids is that at the end of their life, that they are known by God. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And so listen, I know we got a lot of stuff we're praying about for our kids, right? I mean, some of you got kids who are five, six, seven years old. You're already praying for their husbands and their wives. And, you know, that's a good thing. That's, that's, that's appropriate. That's appropriate. It's tough out there. It's tough. I'm, I'm, praying, for, I'm praying for Lauren's husband. I'm really praying for her husband. Uh, <laughs> He's going to have to be a tough fella. <laughs> uh, 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 and, and we want our kids to have good education, and we're trying to make sure they're living in the right neighborhoods, and, and we want to make sure that they have all of the resources they need to try to get a hit. Those are things that matter, yes. But you know what? What matters most is that God knows who they are. And that they know who God is. And that they have a relationship with an eternal God. Why? Why? Why must they have faith? Well, listen, I don't care if they have a six-figure job. You know, there is a such thing as losing your job. If they have great health, we get sick. Great marriages sometimes end in divorce. But the God that we know, particularly in Jesus Christ, will never leave you nor forsake you. And the faith that we have enables us to bounce back after we've hit the ground and continue to move forward. I want my children to know God. Joshua is saying this is the most important thing. Well, as I thought about this, I thought about my grand aunt. And as I've been preparing this for the week and reflecting on this, my grand aunt had a conversation with me very similar to the conversation that Joshua was having in this text. She, uh, at the time, I did not know that she had been diagnosed with cancer. And I did not know that she knew probably at that time that it was reported as terminal. All I know is that she called me in the room one day and she just had a, started talking to me. And she said, Herman, you know, mama's not going to be here with you always. She says, at some point, I'm going home. And I knew by that she meant to be with the Lord. She says, so here's my prayer for you. She says, you need to know Jesus for yourself. Because he will never leave you, nor forsake you. 
And as I reflect back, this is my mama version of Joshua's message to Israel. This is, this is my mama saying, you know what? I've, 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 I've focused on the things that matter. I've tried to give you the best education. I've tried to discipline you. I've really tried to work to turn your life around. But right now, as I think about death, the one thing that matters the most is that I want you to know Jesus. Now, if in fact this is the thing that matters the most, how do we go about transmitting our faith to the next generation? How do I transmit faith to, to Lauren and to Jonathan? What, what matters? Well, first of all is we have to make sure that our faith is personal. Everybody say personal. Personal. In other words, look at how, what Joshua said. Joshua didn't say, as for my family, they will serve the Lord. He says, as for who? Me and my family. We will serve the Lord. There has to be a me before there is a we. It has to exist in you first in order to exist in them. As for me. Everybody shout personal. This has to be personal. Now, I know, as Lauren is here on the front pew, I know that at the end of the day, what's going to shape her faith the most, what's going to really kind of determine whether or not she, she grows up loving Jesus or not, is not how many sermons she hears me preach. What's going to really influence her the most is what she sees at home. Uh, she, she's going to pay attention to, am I loving her mother? How am I treating other people? I mean, this, this, is where, this is where your faith becomes personal. It's worked out in the details of your everyday life. She's going to be paying attention to, uh, 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 how am I spending my money? Am I generous and am I responsible? This is where your faith is worked out in your everyday life. She's going to be paying attention to, do I honor and respect authority, Right? Uh, how many speed limits do I break? How many times do I make a U-turn where I'm not supposed to make a U-turn? Do I, am I cheating on my taxes, right? She, she's paying attention to these, this, this is the place where your faith is worked out in your life. She wants to see, uh, is there ever a time where daddy really doesn't know what God is doing? And can he acknowledge, I don't really understand what God is doing. God has really blown my mind on this. But in the mystery of God, I can still trust him. She, she wants to experience some of that, right? How do I deal with conflict? She wants to be able to see that faith at work in my life. Now, here's an insight. I'm sure Joshua was thinking about Moses, who gave a similar speech decades earlier when he got ready to step down and die as the leader of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, uh, verse 6 uh, through 7, you'll find that version of that speech. And essentially there, Moses says to the adults in the room, he says, he says look, the commandments that I give you today, uh, I want you to, in, in a sense, imprint them on your heart. That's what he says to the adults. See, it's got to be personal for you first. Then he says to the adults, and then I want you to impress them onto the lives of your children. Now, he did not say, I want you to impress your children with the lies. Ask your, somebody next to you, what in the world is he talking about? Ask him. And you say to them, I'm so happy you asked because I don't have the slightest idea. All right. <laughs> Here's what I mean. So often us Christians, we think that in order for our children to grow up loving Jesus, we have to project a false image. But our children always, always knows what's fake and what's faith. And so we don't need to uh, uh, project a false image. We need to let our children see us as we grow in our own faith, we need to be transparent and authentic with our kids. You know, they, they, they need to see areas where we're actually growing. And they can, they can say, you know, you know, the, you know daddy was, was over here last year. Now this year he's here. They, they, they need to see 
the redemptive love and grace of God displayed in our lives. So you don't have to be fake. You just have to be faithful. You don't have to be perfect. You just, you just have to be committed. And so when you mess up, they ought to see daddy say, uh, mama, I messed up. They ought to see you asking for forgiveness. They ought to see you practicing the principles of grace and mercy and experiencing it and giving it in life. You know, they just need to see you as you are before God. Everybody shout personal. personal. Faith has to be personal. This is what I saw with my own grand aunt. I can't tell you the times that I saw her, even in her oldest of age, as frail and thin. I come in and she's down on her knees praying every night. And when she couldn't get out on her knees, when she got past that point physically, she, I would hear at 1 o'clock in the morning because my bed was, was not far from, from hers, just a little small supper. I'd hear her praying 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. I can't tell you all the many times that she forced me to go to church on Wednesday afternoons when she was healthier and she went to a mission meeting and I, I didn't want to go and I'd be sitting in the back blowing uh, 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 saliva bubbles and all of that and, and, and but she was there trying to figure out how to connect the church to the community can't tell you how many times that on first Sundays I'd see her standing she was an usher which we call host here she'd be dressed out in all white she had on her white gloves. She'd be standing on post, and, 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 and she'd be directing. And when the choir's singing, she's crying. I can't tell you how. That, that's uh, my mama practicing her faith. But what was most transformative for me was the subtle connection I saw her make between the faith she practiced and the life she lived. I, I saw her care for folk who didn't really care a whole lot for her. And I wondered, where do you get the strength to do that? But it came out of her prayer life. And I saw her grow. She wasn't perfect. Listen, I, some of the conversations that the kids have with their parents today, I, I couldn't have that kind of conversation with my, my grand aunt. I mean, I mean, if I was, if I was <laughs> she'd call it, uh, uh, she'd call it uh, uh, popping off. That's what she'd call it, popping off. And if I was standing too close and I'd pop off, next thing I know, she'd pop off. <laughs> <laughs> So let's see, in the mid, six, late 60s. Come on now. And, uh, and, uh, and when I got bigger, she, she knew how to use a broom. All right. So she said, <laughs> but even in that area, I watched her grow. Because over the years, she mellowed out and she began to realize, you know what? At the end of the day, this is not going to make Herman become all that I want him to be. At the end of the day, what's going to straighten out his life is that somehow God gets a hold to his heart. So she wasn't perfect, but I watched her grow. And so as I saw her faith manifest in her life, it became attractive to me. So first of all, you've got to make your faith personal. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be flawless. You just have to be faithful. You know, show up at church, be reminded the gospel to be the cornerstone of your life, Learn one practical step to take, go home and go to work and, and try to take that practical step then come back next week, remind that God's supposed to be the cornerstone of your life and, 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 and then learn one practical step that you can take to manifest that, to actualize that. Go try to work on that. And your kids, your grandkids, your niece, your aunts, the kids you're mentoring, mentoring, mentoring they all watching. watch secondly as for me and my house we shall we'll serve the Lord boy I just want you to know Jesus both Joshua and my mom was 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 really fighting for my heart now that's what you have to do as a as a parent as a grandparent as a mentor who's trying to pass faith to the next generation as a young adult who may not have uh, nephews and nieces because you're in your early 20s but you have a lot of extra time which is a commodity uh, because you're a young adult and single uh, once you decide to say you know what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some kids and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour maybe just one kid I'm going to pour myself into that because you know here's what's pretty remarkable my grandma as, as much as she believed that God could do something with my life she only had a little glimpse 
of all that God, she, she, she just had a glimpse of what God has done. She couldn't have imagined that God would use me to help drive health care in Massachusetts and, 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 and that I'd be pastoring a, a large congregation like this and impact. She couldn't have fully imagined, she couldn't have imagined it, but she knew that if I knew Jesus, the sky would be the limit. The thing that mattered the most. So, fight for their hearts. This passage in Joshua backs back up to really chapter 23, the heart of it. This notion of this call to be obedient, to be a part of God's story, really backs up to chapter 23. In chapter 23, verse 9 to 11, notice what Joshua is saying. Joshua is saying, look, your obedience to God, your, your being committed to being part of God's larger story, has everything to do with your figuring out that you can trust God. And has everything to do with your figuring out that you can love God that you can trust God and that God loves you and he calls you to love him. Long before there's rules, this, this is a notion of relationship. And so here in the passage, you'll see, here's, here's Joshua making the point. For the Lord has driven out great and powerful nations for you. No one has yet been able to defeat you. Each one of you will put to flight a thousand of the enemy. For the Lord your God fights for you just as he has, what he says, what is his what? Promise. Promise, promise. Here's a good insight. God is, God is not necessarily committed to making all your dreams come true. Because at the end of the day, he's focused on his story. So he's not always committed to making all of your dreams come true. But he is committed to delivering on whatever he promised you. His commitment to you. And he had promised them, I'm going to bring you into the land and he honors his word. So here's what Joshua is saying. God has proven he's trustworthy. God has proven not only is he trustworthy, but he's loving you and he's fighting for you. And he's pulled you in this story. And so based on that next verse, watch what he says. Based on that, so be careful to love the Lord your God. There's no rules here. I can't rule you into loving God. My, my grand aunt understood that if I opened my heart and if I could start, when she said, I want you to know Jesus, what she meant was, I want you to experience him. And I want you to experience how trustworthy he is. And I want you to experience how loving he is. And I want you to experience how he, how he is a God who will drive his redemptive story through your life. That's what, he was, that's what she was saying. Now, here's how she drove it home for me. Uh, not, not, not in any particular lecture, but, but I, I, I call them God stories. Everybody say God stories. I'm going to talk more practically about this next week, but, 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 but God stories. So, you know, we'd be sitting around, and I'd be sitting on the porch, and I want to get off and play. She said, no, 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 sit here, and she's, she's going to tell me a God story. So she'll tell me. She told me about how she's the oldest of 17 kids, and uh, she loved education. But she had to stop going to school in the eighth grade because her mom needed her to help get the kids out of the, out of the house. And so in the late 50s, early 60s, which is pretty remarkable for an African-American young woman, uh, when, when she, she got back fully on her feet, she went to night school and got her certificate from high school. And I don't think they even called the GED back then, but she went. And you know, here's what she said, Herman, you know what? God is trustworthy. God is faithful. She told me about how in her early life, her first marriage, she married a, a crazy, violent guy who, was, who submitted her to domestic violence. And she prayed for strength. And God gave her the strength. She left this guy, praise God. And, and, and within a matter of years, she actually owned her own little piece of property and a little piece of house before she married my granduncle. And they were married till death did them part. And what she would say to me, sometimes I, we'd be driving the car. She just shared this little story with me, right? And her point being, you know what, Herman? God is trustworthy. He's faithful. You can trust him. She told me about... You know how she thought she was past the child, she was past childbearing age. She'd given up on having her own children. And then out of nowhere, God brought me into her life. Now, I'm sure there was a moment, a little, a little period of time in there where she was thinking, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? But <laughs> ultimately, her point was, 
you know, God can be trusted in his yeses and he can be trusted in his noes. He can be trusted on the mountaintop and he can be trusted in the valley. You can trust him and that God loves you and his love is dependable and his love is always working for you even if you don't see it. That was her lesson for me. You know, some of you guys, you're thinking about your parents and, and your parents may have threw a lot of rules at you and this is my last point, right? That what she was trying to give me was not a set of rules but relationship. And maybe your parents did a lot, threw a lot of rules at you. Maybe they were harsh. They did all this stuff trying to drive church into your life and what they really did was drove you away. I just want you to pause right now. I get it, I get it. But I want you to just kind of reflect back. Maybe they kind of messed it up. Maybe they kind of stumbled into it. But the point that they were really trying to make, and I hope you'll claim that point today, the point that they were really trying to make was this. The thing that matters the most is that you know Jesus. You know his love, his dependability, the fact that he's choosing for you. Choosing for you. Tell somebody next to you, Jesus is choosing for me. Tell him, tell him. He's choosing for me. Ruse. My grand aunt was trying to pass to me a relationship, not Ruse. Now, one of the interesting things about the Bible is that the Bible has said a, a repeatedly in a multitude of ways that God drives his redemptive plan in the world by way of relationships and families. That's why in Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 10 and chapter 11, you have these long genealogies. Any of you have been reading through the book of Genesis and you get to this part, this is the real boring part because it says this person beget, this person beget, this person gave birth to this. You're like, what in the world is this here for? What does this have anything to do with anything? But it's the point that God is making that he's driving his covenant redemptive plan through families. He's marked families. And when you get to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, it's talking about Jesus. It opens up with a genealogy, and it makes the point that Jesus is a part of a 42 uh, representative generations of 42 generations that, that, that God's plan of salvation and faithfulness you know, starts at Abraham, and, 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 and he starts at, in Matthew, starts at Abraham and Sarah, and he drives it all the way through from family to family, from generation to generation, and Jesus comes out of this. It, it, God works through family. God works through redeemed children. And in Luke chapter 5, the same thing starts at the birth of Jesus, and they work backwards. They said Jesus uh, was raised by Joseph, and it works all his way back, all the way back to Adam. And God is just making the same point. From the beginning of human history, my plan was to drive salvation and transformation and hope and healing and love from family to family to family. God is saying, we can't afford to lose the next generation. Transfer to them, not rules, but a relationship. See, if I can get Lauren to love God, if I can get her to love Jesus, I can't be there with all of her decisions when she becomes a teenager, what she's going to make, what she's not. I can try to teach her. The most, I, I can't give her enough rules. I can't give her enough rules. I, I got a few that I'm going to give her, by the way, when it comes to talking with these guys and all that. But, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if Lauren can just love Jesus, it's the love of Jesus at the end of the day will help her to guide her through. Just love Jesus. And you know what? She's going to mess up sometimes, right? She's going to make, but if she loves you and if she knows Jesus loves her, when she messes up, she doesn't have to wallow there. She doesn't have to stay there. She can just grab the grace of God and let him pull up and just, that's what, oh, I just want her to know Jesus. So she's giving me a relationship, not rules. Let me end here. When I think about what my, my grand-aunt passed on to me, I'll put a picture up. And she didn't like to take pictures. She's like, she's like her great-granddaughter, Lauren. And Rhonda, they don't like to take pictures. This is the only picture I have of her. And it was a driver's license picture. And if she was here, she'd pop me upside the head for showing it. It's like, what's wrong with you? You can't tell, but my mom's, her hair would come all the way down to the bottom of her back, but she kept it in a bomb. She's a beautiful woman. But more than her physical feature was her heart. It was her heart. And, you know, 
when she died, she didn't have any jewelry to pass on to me or, you know, stocks or bonds. She had a little house and sat on a little half acre property and, 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 and inevitably I transferred it to a relative who remains living there in Cushada, so I, I don't have that anymore. I had a Buick car that she left and the Buick car, uh, you know, I forget, I think it's like 1974 or whatever, and the rings were gone in the motor. And so when you would drive it, the smoke would fill the back of the seat and, and it would be a big smoke trail behind you. And so people always knew when you were coming. They always knew when you were leaving. <laughs> but uh, I don't have that anymore. And then I didn't find out until I got into my senior year in college that my grand aunt knew that when I was a teenager, I wanted to own a motorcycle. But being as wise woman as she was, she said to her sister, who was my grandmother, uh, and she said, you know, uh, I'm going to give you this money. And she had saved up $700. And she says, don't give it to Herman now because he, he doesn't have enough sense. He'd go kill himself on a motorcycle. She said, wait till you think he's mature enough and then give it to him. And my grandmother held on to that money until I was a senior in college, which says something about my slow maturing process. But, <laughs> but it was only when I got ready to buy my my first car, I was dating uh, Rhonda, we got ready to buy a Toyota Corolla. Rhonda gave me some money to help make the payment, and my grandmother produced this $700. It was almost as though my grandaunt and my wife-to-be was partnering with me in such an amazing way. And that became Rhonda and our first car. But we don't have that car anymore. You know, the fact is that like most material things, all those things had an expiration date. And some of you got a lot more property and a lot more money to leave and all that, and that's great. And I'm not saying those things matter, but I'm telling you what matters the most. See, because at the end of the day, all that material stuff, it has an expiration date. But here's what my grand aunt gave me that has made all the difference. She gave me Jesus. 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 That's what she did. You know, there's a, there's a statement that says that, that, that God doesn't have any grandchildren. And which, what it means is that, that my grandma, my grandaunt's faith uh, could, could not, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get to Jesus on her faith. I got to have my own, that's what she was saying. I had to have my own relationship with him. I had to know him for myself. But, but, but how she lived her life in her faithfulness of Mr. Flaws made faith in Jesus attractive to me. Made me say there's power there. You know, and, and, and I'll end it here. My grandma, you know, she wouldn't argue with anybody about religion. She would respect everybody's religion as we ought to do. But when it came to her son, she didn't want to leave no bones. She said, look, I want you to know Jesus. I, I, no, 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 Jesus, the one who came and died for your sins and conquered death, Jesus, because boy, listen here, you're still having trouble. You know, some girls are picking over you and, 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 and you don't feel love, but if you know God in Jesus Christ who gave his life on Calvary's cross, you will know that he has an unconditional love for you, that he, that he loves you, he's picked you, come on now, and he's got a purpose for you, and don't worry about who overlooks you. When he lifts you up, everybody will have to acknowledge it. Come on now, that's his unconditional love. And she said, boy, uh, uh, you need to know Jesus because the kind of trouble you're getting into. You need to know that he's got an unlimited forgiveness. Come on now. And so no matter how long your rap sheet is, his forgiveness is way longer. And she said, boy, you need to know Jesus. Why? Because there is a grace, shout grace, grace that's in Jesus that will open doors that are shut in your face, that will make rough places smooth, a grace, come on now, that will lift you up when you fall down, a grace that will give you favor, that will cause people to open up opportunity for you, a grace. And here's what she ultimately said. She didn't, she didn't say it, but I know she, this is what she's thinking. She's thinking, you know, I'm dying. I can't be there with you. 
She said, this, she did say this. But Jesus would never leave you or forsake you. And one day, Herman, you're going to die. But at the end of your life, watch it. I want you to know Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, his unconditional love, his unlimited forgiveness, his, his, his remarkable and amazing grace, come on now, death will not have the last word. It's just going to be, it, 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 you, know, you know, Jesus takes the period after death and turns it into a comma. Come on, it's a pause. It's a transition. And come on, and the grave will open up. And baby boy, you and I, we're going to see each other again. Praise God. And, and, and that's what she gave to me. And that's what I'm giving to Lauren. And that's what I want to give to Jonathan because one day, come on now, we all going to die, but I'm expecting to live again. You best know Jesus. Amen. 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 Give God a hand, praise. So now you got to consider the question. We're going to pick back up here next week, but consider the question, what's your next step? Some people, it is to say yes to Jesus. It is to trust him with faith. Not facts. You can't explain everything. If you've got facts, you don't need faith. But it's faith. And you've got a connection card, you ought to check that off. For somebody else, it's say, I'm going to go public with my faith. You're going to be baptized. For somebody else, I'm going to get in a small group because I want to walk with some people who can help me to grow. I'm tired of just hearing about Jesus. I want to get to know him. And that happens in community. But if all of you are looking at your connection card and you're watching my video, here's the, here's the commitment I want you to make. Whether you're married or divorced or single or young adult, if you believe in Jesus, I want you to find a way to invest in the next generation. You don't have to beat them up with scripture. You, I hope you've been listening to me. It's not about the rules you try to shove down their throats. Live a Jesus-filled life and pour into them. If you're willing to do that, maybe your niece or aunts, uh, your niece or your nephews, grandkids, all I want you to write is simply, I'll bless the next generation. And turn that card in as a statement of commitment. God bless you.